Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Space This Week is your Monday coverage of all the rocket launches and space events scheduled to take place over the coming days, as well as a recap of all the launches and major events that happened last week. We'll be taking a look at launches across the world, as well as taking a trip down memory lane as we look at all the historic spaceflight anniversaries scheduled to take place over the next seven days. Before we get started, make sure you've subscribed using the button and bell below so that you get these videos on time to end sure that the news you're about to hear is up to date, correct and current. And with the intro out of the way, let's commence our first segment, all the launches that took place last week. The first launch of last week was on the 14th of January and was Blue Origin's latest New Shepard mission. This was a suborbital test flight that flew straight up, just breaching the barrier of space, reaching an apogee around 7 kilometers above the Kármán line, before falling back down and landing Falcon 9 style on its landing pad. This is similar to how sounding rockets fly, and while this particular flight doesn't differ too drastically to previous New Shepard missions, it did test the new and improved six-seat passenger module that features a number of upgrades over its predecessor, with notable improvements to the astronaut experience. While no astronauts were on board the spacecraft, it was occupied by Anakin Skywalker, Blue Origin's instrument-laden test dummy that's flown aboard previous New Shepard missions, and with this latest crew capsule acing its parachute landing not too far from the booster, it's safe to assume that this won't be his last outing aboard a Blue Origin vehicle. The second flight of the new crew capsule is expected to take place in late February, and will have a similar mission profile to this one. Sadly, I'd hoped I'd now get to talk about an Electron rocket and a Starlink launch, however, both of these missions have now been pushed back to this week, which brings brings me to the final launch of last week, which was Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 vehicle. I think. Its launch window opens less than 12 hours before this video is set to go live, and just so happens to be when I plan on being asleep, so unfortunately I can't really say with any great certainty whether or not Virgin Orbit's two-stage air-launched rockets took flight or not. I covered the flight plan fairly extensively in last week's episode, so I'll leave an on-screen card and link down below if you want to hear more about this flight there. I'll recap this mission once I've confirmed it's, you know, happened next Monday if all goes well. Although that's all the launches that took place, that's not all of the news that took place. We got to see a few static fires from two different rocket development sites, one of which being NASA's SLS rocket, with a static fire test of its mammoth cluster of four RS-25 engines, aka Space Shuttle main engines, in order to demonstrate the readiness of the massive rocket's first stage ahead of its first launch. This was arguably the biggest moment in the SLS's development history so far, but unfortunately, this isn't really a success story. The burn was supposed to last 8 minutes, but just 67 seconds after it begun, the engines unexpectedly shut down due to a major component failure. What exactly this major component failure was remains to be seen, and NASA Chief Jim Bridenstine stated that a thorough investigation into the engine shutoff will be commenced. I'm hoping that the issue is easily fixed and the test can be reattempted soon, but the words major component failure are never good to hear, and considering the sheer number of delays and shortcomings the SLS has faced over its lengthy and expensive production leaves a lot of people with doubts over the rocket's ability, especially when comparing the bloated cost and slow development compared to the rapid development process of SpaceX's Starship. And speaking of which, let's take a look down at Boca Chica, Texas to see how the Starship's development is going. I once again refer to the brilliant Brendan Lewis, who produces these great infographics on a regular basis to update the world on what's happening at SpaceX's Texan rocket farm. As you can see, work is coming along well on Starship's SN9 to SN17, and the first Super Heavy prototype is shaping up nicely as well. Note the little SN7.2. This is another one-off test tank, this one being made of the same stainless steel alloy of the late SN7.1, but this time it's just 3mm in width as opposed to 4mm. Presumably this will be tested to destruction like the previous SN7 prototypes, SN7 and SN7.1, and if SpaceX can prove the validity of the thinner material then its use could save up to 20 tonnes of mass in a full Starship vehicle, which of course translates to more payload capacity. 
Of course, the vehicle I think we're all most interested in is the SN9, which is currently undergoing testing on the launch pad. Having already clocked in one static fire test on January the 6th, last week on January the 13th, we saw the vehicle perform a whopping three static fires within the space of just three hours, a never before seen feat with a Starship vehicle, and Elon Musk reported on Twitter that all three were a success. Sadly, this doesn't mean that we'll get to see the vehicle fly exceptionally soon, as it was later confirmed confirmed that two of the three Raptor engines would need to undergo some slight repairs, so will need to be switched out, and their replacements of course will need to be tested before flight could be attempted. Senior space editor at Ars Technica, Eric Berger, tweeted that he was hearing rumours that the news surrounding the need for repair wasn't good and that we shouldn't bet on the vehicle flying before February. It's not been reported if there's anything necessarily wrong with the SN9 itself, but of course there may be internal systems that aren't functioning as expected. Perhaps the three back-to-back -back static fires took some toll on the rocket as well. I imagine we'll hear more about the SN9's fate over the coming days, though hopefully with its one cryogenic proof and four total static fires, I think at the very least our fears that it'd be scrapped following its tumble in the high bay can be quashed. In other sombre Starship news, the SN6, which performed a 150 meter hop on September the 3rd last year, and which we'd hoped may have been the bearer of the white moonship nose cone mock-up, was disassembled and scrapped by SpaceX. I'm optimistic that its predecessor, the SN5, won't meet a similar fate given that this was the first ever full-scale Starship tank to take to the skies, and instead it'll be immortalised as a monument like the Starhopper that came before it. As for the other prototypes, things are coming along nicely. For anyone wondering why the SN13 and 14 look strangely incomplete compared with their counterparts, don't forget that Brendan's diagrams are composed using photographic evidence of parts that have been spotted on site. There may well be SN13 and SN14 parts that exist, but are not publicly known about. But I think that's enough coverage of Starship development, but I hope you're enjoying the video so far, and if you leave a like down below to show your support, then it's always very much appreciated. Let's now move along to our next segment, all the news expected to happen this week. <laughs> The first flights of the week will be today, Monday the 18th of January, and will be the Electron and Starlink missions that were delayed from last week. Electron is scheduled first, which will once again take off from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. The Electron is owned and operated by Rocket Lab, and this time they'll be launching a single communication microsatellite for European Multinational Technology Corporation, OHBSE, on this mission, which has been dubbed Another One Leaves the Crust. Starlink is scheduled to launch a few hours later. SpaceX's mission objective with Starlink is to provide the globe with high-speed internet, and this latest launch doesn't really differ from previous flights. The Falcon 9 rocket will take off from the Kennedy Space Center, once again with 60 Starlink satellites on board. What is significant about this flight, though, is that this will be the first time a Falcon 9 first stage has flown for the eighth time, and SpaceX plan to recover it once again, around 630 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. Fairing recovery is also expected, and the Starlink satellites will deploy not too long after first stage landing. This will push the number of Starlink satellites into the quadruple figure range. This flight will bring the total number of satellites launched to 1,013. Tomorrow, on January the 19th, we'll see the first rocket launch of 2021 from China. This will be a workhorse Long March 3B E rocket launching from the Zichang launch complex. On board will be a Chinese Tianton 1 communication satellite, which will be placed in geosynchronous Earth orbit. The 20th of January, we'll see another Chinese rocket launch, this time a Hyperbola 1 vehicle taking off from the Huiquan Satellite Launch Center. This will be the second ever flight of the Hyperbola 1 rocket, a small sat launch vehicle operated by private Chinese firm iSpace. On board will be a small satellite bound for low Earth orbit, but as of yet, it's not clear what the purpose of this satellite will be. The first Hyperbola 1 launch took place in July 2019, and among its numerous payloads was a curious red car mounted to a plinth. I definitely got a bit of deja vu from that. Presumably, this is not a full-scale car, of course. <laughs> January the 21st, we'll see the launch of another Falcon 9 rocket, but this is an interesting one. The Falcon 9 will be carrying a whopping 82 satellites. Yes, this will be SpaceX's first dedicated rideshare mission, which has been given the designation Transporter 1. It's quickly worth noting that the satellites on board are constantly changing and can be added and or removed right up until the fairings are sealed, so things might still change 
change in terms of the numbers. However, so far it's confirmed that the launch will be on behalf of a variety of customers from countries from all over the world. There are satellites for the United States, Italy, Canada, Finland, Japan, Taiwan, Turkey, France, Lithuania, Switzerland and Germany. There's also 10 SpaceX Starlink satellites on board as well. SpaceX planned to land the Falcon 9 first stage around 550 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, and one can assume they'll be attempting to recover the fairing halves as well. The satellites will be placed into a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. But unless the aforementioned Virgin Launcher 1 mission was delayed from last week, then the Transporter 1 is the final expected launch set to take place this week, which means we can start thinking about moving on to our space history segment. <laughs> Our first anniversary is a birthday! On the 20th of January, Buzz Aldrin will be celebrating his 91st year on Earth, but of course not all of his time has been spent here. He was among the two men who first stepped foot on the surface of the moon, the other of course being Neil Armstrong. Buzz Aldrin is a true hero for two key reasons. First, he bravely risked his life to realize one of humankind's greatest achievements, and second, he gave a moon landing denial a moron, a great punch. <laughs> Here's to you, you legend. The 21st of January will mark the 1960 anniversary of the flight of Little Joe 1B. The Little Joe series of rockets were effectively test platforms to test various different rocket systems. Little Joe 1B was a Mercury spacecraft that took off from Wallops Island, Virginia, with Miss Sam on board, a female rhesus monkey. The flight itself was designed to test the Mercury spacecraft's launch escape system, and the rocket flew to a height of 15 kilometers and a range of 19 kilometers out to sea. Happily, Miss Sam survived the eight and a half minute voyage in good condition, and the spacecraft was recovered by helicopter and returned to Wallops Island within about 45 minutes. Also on January the 21st, this time in 2018, Rocket Lab's Electron rocket became the world's first ever rocket to reach orbit using an electric pump-fed engine, and once there it deployed three CubeSats. This was the second flight of the Electron, as the first didn't quite reach orbit due to a communication equipment glitch on the ground. The Rutherford engines of the Electron were designed to make the flight to space as affordable as possible, they're built almost entirely out of 3D printed parts, and are powered by batteries, meaning that lots of expensive hardware can be replaced with software. In a traditional rocket engine, liquid fuel and liquid oxidizer combine within a combustion chamber and ignite. Now the same is true for Electron's Rutherford, however, getting the propellants to the combustion chamber isn't an easy process. There needs to be separate turbo pumps that can transport the fuels at very high speed into the high pressure chamber. Usually this is done with another engine whose sole purpose is to drive the pumps, which necessitates extra hardware and consumes additional fuel. But the Rutherford does away with that. The engine's turbo pumps are simply powered by electric motors, eliminating the complexity of the traditional turbo pump. Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck states that the electric motors of the Electron are about 95% efficient, compared to the 60% efficiency of traditional gas motors. While the Electron remains the only orbital class rocket with an electric pump-fed first stage, Astra is hard at work with their Rocket 3, which, when operational, will join Electron in this exclusive club, since its five Delphin engines are also fed by electric pumps. On the 22nd of January in 1968, Apollo 5 lifts off. This was an uncrewed test of the Apollo lunar module, which would eventually carry astronauts down to the lunar surface. The payload was launched by a Saturn 1B rocket, and once in Earth orbit, the ground crews performed several tests of the lunar module's systems and engines, with the flight being declared a success after its 11 hours and 10 minutes of rigorous testing. Our final anniversary of the week is on the 23rd of January, when, in 2003, one last very weak signal from Pioneer 10 is detected. This would be the last time we would communicate with the spacecraft, and unfortunately no usable data could be extracted from the transmission. I think, however, it's safe to say that we definitely got our money's worth with the Pioneer 10. It was launched all the way back in 1972, and it was originally only designed to last 21 months on a mission to fly by Jupiter. 
it would eventually end up operating for a staggering 30 years. During its flight, the plucky spacecraft netted a few firsts, including the first spacecraft to fly beyond Mars, the first to fly through the main asteroid belt, the first to fly past Jupiter, the first to travel beyond Neptune, and the first to use all nuclear electrical power, and the first spacecraft to be placed on a trajectory to escape the solar system into interstellar space. The images of Jupiter returned by Pioneer 10 far exceeded the best images taken from Earth at the time. I always wonder how amazing it must have been to finally see the planets in such high detail for the first time, when today we take the appearance of the solar system's inhabitants for granted. Anyway, Pioneer 10's last communication is, fittingly, the last anniversary left to talk about this week. <laughs> And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Space This Week. Thanks to the launch delays of Rocket Lab and SpaceX, and with the promise of two launches from China, these next seven days certainly look like good ones for rocket launch enthusiasts. While you wait for the next launch though, why not check out one of the links on screen? The left panel is a link to the full Space This Week playlist, while the right panel is a link to a random video from my channel selected by YouTube based on your personal viewing history. You can also find a link to subscribe so you never miss out on Space News and you can check out my Patreon as well to help support the show monetarily if you'd like. Thank you for watching guys and I'll see you all on Saturday in my next Kerbal video.